This is Adel Gasly. I'm going to present to you part three of the chapter about DC machines. In this part, I will cover the principle of operation of DC machines and their classification. I will start by showing to you an animation that describes the DC motor principle of operation. It is available at YouTube at the link that is provided below and in the video description also. You can find DC motors in many portable home appliances, automobiles, and types of industrial equipment. In this video, we will logically understand the operation and construction of a commercial DC motor. Let's first start with the simplest DC motor possible. It looks like this. The stator provides a constant magnetic field and the armature which is the rotating part, is a simple coil. The armature is connected to a DC power source through a pair of commutator rings. When the current flows through the coil, an electromagnetic force is induced on it according to the Lorentz law, so the coil will start to rotate. You will notice that as the coil rotates, the commutator rings connect with the power source of opposite polarity. As a result, on the left side of the coil, the electricity will always flow away, and on the right side, electricity will always flow towards. This ensures that the torque action is also in the same direction throughout the motion, so the coil will continue rotating. But, if you observe the torque action on the coil closely, you will notice that, when the coil is nearly perpendicular to the magnetic flux, the torque action nears zero. As a result, there will be irregular motion of the rotor if you run such a DC motor. Here is the trick to overcoming this problem. Add one more loop to the rotor with a separate commutator pair for it. In this arrangement, when the first loop is in the vertical position, the second loop will be connected to the power source. So a motive force is always present in the system. Moreover, the more such loops, the smoother will be the motor rotation. In a practical motor, the armature loops are fitted inside slots of highly permeable steel layers. This will enhance magnetic flux interaction. Spring-loaded commutator brushes help to maintain contact with the power source. A permanent magnet stator pole is used only for very small DC motors. Most often, an electromagnet is used. The field coil of the electromagnet is powered from the same DC source. The field coils can be connected to the rotor windings in two different ways. Parallel or series. The result is two different kinds of DC motor constructions, a shunt and a series motor. The series wound motor has good starting torque, but its speed drops drastically with the load. The shunt motor has a low starting torque, but it is able to run almost at a constant speed irrespective of the load acting on the motor. Unlike the other electrical machines, DC motors exhibit a unique characteristic, the production of back EMF. A rotating loop in magnetic field will produce an EMF according to the principle of electromagnetic induction. The case of rotating armature loops is also the same. An internal EMF will be induced that opposes the applied input voltage. The back EMF reduces armature current by a large amount. Back EMF is proportional to the speed of the rotor. At the starting of the motor, back EMF is too low, thus the armature current becomes too high, leading to the burnout of the rotor. Thus, a proper starting mechanism that controls the applied input voltage is necessary in large DC motors. 
Let us review again the principle of operation step by step. We know from the electromagnetic rules that, according to Lenz law, a conductor wire flowing an electric current I and place it in a magnetic field B is subject to a force F called Lorentz force. To find the direction of this force F, we can use the left hand rule or what is called motor rule. What you need to do is to put your middle finger in the direction of the current, then the index finger in the direction of the flux or flux density, and the thumb finger will show the resulting force direction. The Lorentz force exerted on a portion of electric wire with a length L can be calculated as the product of the current I flux density B and wire length L. F is expressed in Newton, B in Tesla, L in meters and I in amperes. We can apply the same principle to the wires forming the armature winding of a DC machine. Let us consider that the position of a conductor A is in front of the North Pole and that of the other side of coil conductor B is in front of the South Pole. Note that the brushes are always placed between the poles as shown in this figure. For a two-pole machine, we have two brushes only. We consider that brush 1 is on segment 1 that connects to the coil A and brush 2 is on segment 2 that connects to the coil wire B. The plus sign on the conductor designates an entering current direction, while the minus sign designates an exiting current direction. So in this case, the current I will be entering at wire A and exiting at wire B. Now using the left hand rule, we can find that the direction of the Lorentz force F on the conductor A is downward, which tries to pull the conductors down while the force on the conductor B is upward, which tries to push the conductor B up. Because both conductors are having the same current magnitude and flux density, the resulting forces on these conductors will have the same amplitude also. So these two forces create a torque on the surface of the armature, which rotates the armature in anti-clockwise direction. During the rotation, Conductor A will move under the South Pole, while conductor B will move under the North Pole at a certain time. Because of the commutator action, the current under brush 1 will be always entering, and the other one under brush 2 will be exiting. So the resulting forces on A and B will be the same as those exerted on B and A in their earlier position. Note that the producer torque will be in the same direction, trying to rotate the armature anti-clockwise. With this configuration, the torque is called unidirectional and is independent of the conductor positions. To reverse this torque direction, you need to reverse either the current direction or the flux direction. Let's see that with a better 3D representation. So if the coil is placed in a constant magnetic flux density B, and we inject a current I in the coil through the brushes and commutator, then according to the left hand rule, a force will be generated on the coil conductors, creating a torque which will force the armature to rotate. However, when the brushes commutate between two segments and come into a position where they short circuit two commutator segments under different potentials, sparks will be generated between the short circuit segments. This phenomenon is called arcing and is one of the drawbacks of a brushed machine limiting its application. And that is why brushed DC machines cannot be applied in hazardous or explosive areas. Most DC machines, particularly large ones, have more than two poles, so most of the armature conductors can be in the region of high air gap density. This figure shows a DC machine with four poles on its stator. This calls for an armature winding that will also produce four poles on its rotor. The resulting air gap flux density distribution 
due to the stator poles is shown in this figure. Note that for the four pole machine, in going around the air gap once, which is one mechanical cycle, two electric cycles of variation of the flux density distribution are encountered. Now, if we define theta ed as the electrical degrees or angular measure in cycles, and theta md as the mechanical degrees or angular measure in space, then for a p-pole machine, we can write that theta ed is equal p over 2 multiplied by theta md, where p is the number of poles. So p over 2 is actually the number of pairs of poles. Notice also that the distance between the centers of two adjacent poles is known as pole pitch or pole span and equals to 180 degree electric degrees or 300 over P mechanical degrees. The two sides of a coil are placed into slots on the rotor surface. The distance between the two sides of a coil is called the coil pitch. If the coil pitch is one pole pitch, it is called a full pitch coil. But if the coil pitch is less than one pole pitch, the coil is known as a short pitch or fractional pitch coil. The DC armature winding is mostly made of full pitch coils. Now let us study the back electromotive force induced in the armature coils. As you know, according to Faraday's law, we can write that the EMF, the electromotive force, induced in one conductor during one revolution is equal to the flux per revolution over the time per revolution, which can be expressed as follows, where P is the number of poles, phi is the flux per pole, is expressed in Weber, and M is the speed of the motor in the revolution per minute, an RPM, and the time of one revolution is actually equal to 60 over an M and it's expressed in second. Since the total EMF is actually the sum of all EMFs produced by all the conductors of coils connected in series, which number is equal to the total number of conductors in armature divided by the number of parallel paths? Then we can write the total EMF expression as shown here. This equation can be developed further as follows where Z is the total number of armature conductors and A is the number of parallel paths, which is equal to 2 for wave winding and P for lap winding, as we have seen previously. Notice that the EMF is a function of the rotor speed and the per pole flux. Now, if we express the relation between the rotor speed and F in revolution per minute, and its angular velocity omega m in radian per second, we can write that nm is equal omega m multiplied by 60 divided by 2 pi. Of course, this is easily obtained by considering that one revolution is 2 pi radian and one minute is actually 60 seconds. So we can write the equation of the total EMF as follows. Note that Pz over 2 pi A is a constant that depends on the construction of the machine and not on its operation. Therefore, we can represent this constant by Ka, which is called the armature constant. So the total EMF of the armature winding is equal to the armature constant Ka multiplied by the flux per pole phi and the rotor angular velocity omega m, or the speed in radian per second. You can easily notice that at zero speed, the back EMF is also zero, which means that when the motor is at standstill before starting, the EMF or the back EMF is initially equal to zero. It will build up once the speed starts increasing. There are various methods by which an expression can be derived for the developed torque in the armature when the armature windings carry 
current in the magnetic field produced by the stator poles. Now, let us study the developed torque, or what is also called electromagnetic torque. A simple method is to use the concept of Lorentz force on a conductor with length L and carrying a current IC, place it in a flux with a density B, then the force is FC equal BLIC. Let us consider the following structure of a four-pole machine and look at what's happening for one turn only. So consider the turn A, A prime, B, B prime, whose two conductors A, A prime and B, B prime are placed under two adjacent poles. The force on a conductor placed on the periphery of the armature is given by FC is equal BLIC, which is equal to BLIA over A, where IC is the current in the conductor of the armature winding and IA is the armature terminal current. Since we have A parallel branches, then the conductor current is normally equal to the total current divided by A. So the torque developed by one conductor is given by TC equal FC multiplied by R, where R is the radius of the armature. The average torque developed by one conductor is therefore TC equal BLIA over A multiplied by R. Now considering that the area per pole is A, which is equal to 2 pi L over P, we can rewrite the average torque uh, on a conductor as TC is equal phi PIA over 2 pi A. Since all the conductors in the armature winding develop torque in the same direction and thus contribute to the average torque developed by the armature, the total torque developed is TE is equal to NTC where N is the total number of turns multiplied by 2 because each turn has two conductors. Or we can write that T is equal N phi P over pi A I A, which is equal to K A phi I A. K A is actually the armature constant that we have seen when you study the back EMF. So based on the total developed torque equation that we have seen previously, and the total back EMF equation, then we can deduce that T E over E A is equal to IA over omega m, which is also equivalent to write the mechanical power is equal to the electric power. So TE omega m is equal IA EA. This is based on the electromechanical energy conversion principle. After studying the principle of operation of DC machines, let us look at their classification. DC machines, motors and generators, are classified under different classes depending on the connection of their field winding and armature winding. In fact, the field circuit and the armature circuit can be interconnected in various ways to provide a wide variety of performance characteristics which are considered as an outstanding advantage of DC machines. They could be separately excited where the field winding and the armature winding are fed from two separate sources, or self-excited, where the field winding and armature winding are fed from only one source, it's the same source. Or instead of using uh, winding and excitation, we could use a permanent magnet, where the field does not have any winding and the field flux is produced by the magnets. Now the self-excited machines are themselves subdivided into three categories. The first one is shant, in which the field and armature winding are connected in parallel to the same source. Second, the series category, in which the field and armature windings are connected in series. And the third is the compound category, the, where the field has two windings, one connected in series with the armature and the other one connected in parallel. Depending how the series and shant field windings polarities are connected, we can have the cumulative flux type and the differential flux type. Also, depending on how the series and shant windings are connected with the armature, we can distinguish two types, the long shant and the short shant. Note that the series winding 
has fewer turns but carries a larger current than the shunt winding. A DC machine can be represented by an equivalent circuit consisting of a circular armature with two brushes on top of it and a connection to the DC source. The field winding is drawn on the horizontal axis perpendicular to the armature brush axis. So this is the equivalent circuit representation of a separately excited DC machine that can operate as a motor or as a generator depending on the flow of energy. This one is the equivalent circuit of a shunt machine. And this circuit represents the series connection type. This one is for the compound short shunt connection. And this one is for the compound long shunt connection. The short refers to the case where the shunt field winding is connected directly to the armature winding terminals, while in the long shunt, the shunt field winding is connected to the source terminals. That is why it is called long shunt. However, there is no significant difference between these two connections. Now for the compound connection, if the magnetic field generated by the shunt winding add to that of the series winding, like in this case, the machine is called cumulative compound. But if the shunt and series magnetic field oppose each other, the machine is called a differential compound machine. So in the compound machine, the series winding MMF may add or oppose the shunt winding MMF, resulting in different performance characteristics. You may wonder why do we need all these configurations and classes of DC machines? The answer will be clarified later when we study further the characteristics of the DC machines. However, I can simply say now that each configuration has a different torque speed characteristic that fits into different applications. These are examples of how the speed versus torque characteristics of the different classes we have seen look like. For instance, the shunt or separately excited motor is suitable for applications where the mechanical load speed does not depend on the torque, such as in lifts applications. While the series motor is suitable for high starting torque machines or applications, such as drills and traction applications. This is the end of this part. Thank you for watching.